Wunderbar. Liebe Zuhörerinnen, Zuschauer zu Hause oder im Büro oder wo auch immer Sie uns folgen, ich begrüße Sie ganz herzlich zu dieser besonderen Veranstaltung. Ich muss mich entschuldigen, wir sind ein bisschen zu spät aufgrund von technischen äh, Schwierigkeiten, aber eine technische Universität hat auch mal technische Schwierigkeiten. Ähm, damit müssen wir einfach leben. Ja, wir haben heute eine ganz besondere Veranstaltung vor uns, eine besondere Veranstaltung in besonderen Zeiten, nämlich in Zeiten der Pandemie, die uns ja wirklich alle mitnimmt. Sie berührt uns sozial, sie berührt uns emotional, beruflich und auch privat, sodass wir dachten, wir sollten sie mit unseren hochrangigen Wissenschaftlern und Expertinnen hier am Klinikum Rechts der ESA und der Technischen Universität München über die aktuelle Forschung zu diesem Gebiet auf dem Laufenden halten. Wir planen von jetzt an insgesamt sieben Veranstaltungen, die sich diesem Thema widmen. Wir beginnen mit den medizinischen Themen, hören heute zum Beispiel durch Herrn Professor Knolle, wie unser Immunsystem auf das Virus reagiert, erfahren dann ähm, etwas über die Entdeckung des Virus bis hin zur Impfung. Wir hören über ethische und rechtliche Themen und am Ende sogar auch, welche Auswirkungen diese Pandemie auf die globale Gesundheit haben wird. Ähm, geplant ist, dass diese Vorlesung oder dieser Vortrag aufgezeichnet ist, sodass Sie auch später noch die Möglichkeit haben, diesem zu folgen. Ganz kurz zu meiner Person. Mein Name ist Marion Kichle und ich habe die Freude und die Ehre, Sie durch diese sieben Vorträge und Vorlesungen begleiten zu dürfen und diese moderieren zu dürfen. Aber jetzt gleich zu unserem ersten Vortragenden. Es ist Professor Percy Knolle. Er hat hier an der Technischen Universität München den Lehrstuhl für molekulare Immunologie inne. Er selbst ist von der Ausbildung her Mediziner, Facharzt für Innere Medizin und ein Leberspezialist. Und sein Forschungsgebiet beschäftigt sich mit der Immunantwort von ähm, Erregern wie also Viren. Das heißt, sein Gebiet ist es, zu herauszufinden, wie unsere Immunantwort, unsere Gewebezellen reagieren, wenn sie es mit einem Virus zu tun haben. Sein erster, dieser erste Vortrag beschäftigt sich also damit, wie unser Immunsystem das Virus kontrolliert. Also ein sehr spannendes Thema, denn vielleicht haben Sie gehört, der eine steckt besser weg, diese, den Kontakt mit dem Virus, der andere sehr, reagiert sehr, sehr ernst darauf, muss auf einer intensivmedizinischen Station behandelt werden. Und warum das so ist und wie unser Körper damit umgeht, hören Sie jetzt von Herrn Professor Percy Knolle. Lieber Percy, ich freue mich sehr, dass du uns jetzt Einblicke gibst in deine Forschung und was unser Körper so mit so einem Virus alles anstellt. Bitte schön, du hast das Wort. Ja, yeah, thank you very much, uh, Marion, for these introductory notes. Um, it's a pleasure to start this lecture series uh, with you tonight. Uh, we are sorry that we cannot broadcast this um, online, but I hope that you will have the chance to watch this then at a later point in time. So what I will discuss with you today is how our immune response copes with SARS-CoV-2 infection. And um, as introduced to you by Professor Kichler, I will try to span from the infection all the way to the um, COVID-19 uh, disease process. So let me start by um, framing um, this talk with a couple of data on the discovery um, and the uh, general clinical course. Um, so the first records of um, SARS-CoV-2 date back to December of 2019, uh, where the first cases were recorded 
Meanwhile, we know that there may be even earlier cases than um, um, this as um, in this review from um, um, September of uh, 2020. Um, the virus quickly spread um, within Wuhan and uh, then was actually um, traveling together, together with uh, people to um, basically all countries across the world. Uh, already in February, the World Health Organization uh, started a risk assessment and on 11th of March, the WHO declared COVID-19 as a pandemic. Um, so this marks a, a tremendous uh, speed um, of the spread of this virus, uh, but it, uh, during this time, uh, many different steps in, um, were recognized um, as being um, essential to the spread of the virus throughout the world, such as human-to-human -human transmission. Um, in October uh, 2020, um, we uh, were in a situation where we had over 34 million cases and 1 million deaths. Now we are far beyond that. So the actual data at the moment are that there are um, an ever-increasing number of um, infections um, across um, the, the world. Um, and we see a dramatic rise of um, infections, but also death uh, from COVID-19 uh, in the United States, um, in the United Kingdom, um, but also across the world. The infection process uh, itself with SARS-CoV-2 um, has now been recognized to be airborne. So it's a transmission um, that occurs uh, through viruses that are distributed through aerosols into the um, surrounding and there the inhaling of the air um, leads then to ingestion of the virus into the upper respiratory tract and um, epithelial cells of the upper respiratory tract then get infected. So this mostly happens in enclosed spaces um, and upon prolonged exposure to aerosols uh, and very often in this situation, we also have an inadequate ventilation. Um, what is quite different uh, from the transmission of viruses through respiratory droplets, which are larger in size and typically only have a range of around 1.5 meters, aerosols have the capacity to stay within rooms for hours after they uh, were um, produced and they can actually remain um, um, within the air. So they are not sinking down to the ground. So this um, allows even an infection process after the person who has actually been producing the infectious aerosols has left the room and makes it um, mandatory to um, actually avoid closed spaces, to avoid a prolonged exposure to aerosols and to avoid rooms that do not have an adequate ventilation. This is aggravated by the fact that SARS-CoV-2 infects at a time point when infected individuals are not aware that they are infected because in many instances um, they are asymptomatic or they suffer from um, symptoms that are not typical for um, or unique to uh, SARS-CoV-2 such as a slight cough, a running nose, or, or fever. Um, it is also accelerated by the fact that the viral load that is generated early during this infection process is very high. So meaning that also the virus that is expelled into the air within the aerosols uh, is at a very high concentration within the air. Um, and furthermore, um, the spread through these aerosols is not um, limited to um, certain actions such as sneezing that is typical for respiratory droplets, but of course in a normal setting, if you just breathe or if you talk. So making it an insidious process of infection, uh, which can only be prevented by following the general rules that everybody knows by heart now uh, to wear masks and to keep distance. 
Now, this is an electron micrograph of um, the uh, SARS-CoV-2. So what you see here is the typical appearance of this virus by electron microscopy here, shown in false color. Uh, and you see these little spikes uh, that make the virus look like a crown, and therefore the name of this virus, uh, coronavirus. Um, the term SARS um, stands for Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome and is related to the first description um, of illness following the viral infection, which was mainly um, a lung infection and lung disease leading to a, um, um, difficulty in breathing and respiratory insufficiency, and therefore SARS. As we will discuss later on, this is um, um, however, a misconception because we are talking about a multi-system disease in SARS-CoV-2. Um, so here in this uh, sketch, you see how the um, surface of uh, the virus of the viral particle is believed to look like with these um, spike antigens that occur in trimers and are where the surface of this virus is covered in these. So we are not um, an easy prey for this virus um, because our body bears a defense system against viral infection, not only against SARS-CoV-2, but in general against all kinds of viral infections. And there are two kinds of um, barriers, the most important barriers to um, a viral infection. So first of all, we have natural barriers such as the skin or mucosa. Uh, so in both instances, um, there is a distancing effect. So for instance, in the skin, layers of dead cells that prevent access of virus to um, living skin cells. And in the mucosa, the mucosa is actually producing mucus and therefore preventing also the virus from directly making contact to the epithelial cells. Um, so distancing is also a measure that is used by the body to uh, defend against viral infection. But the more important um, barrier or defense system is the immune system. And within the immune system, there are two arms. One is an arm that is kicking in immediately after the infection within hours, uh, minutes to hours. And this is called innate immunity, so inborn immunity. And there is a second phase, uh, which is actually carried through rather a highly specific reaction via lymphocytes. And this is called adaptive because here selection processes are um, taken in order to um, achieve a highly selective defense um, against the intruder. But I'll introduce you to this later. And the purpose of this is to attack the virus directly and eliminate infected cells. So you see that these are all already fundamental, fundamentally different aspects of defense against the virus. These are again, for illustration, um, two electron micrographs of now respiratory tract epithelial cells. You recognize them easily through the cilia. And you see here plenty of viruses, <coughs> sorry, that are located on the surface of this um, epithelial cell because it's infected and the virus is actually multiplying here and um, leaving the cell again to infect the next host. <coughs> so the infection process of SARS-CoV-2 itself is mediated through these little red spikes that are um, depicted here on the surface of the virus. And this gives you a um, the view of the um, atom uh, <clears throat> atom resolution view of the uh, structure uh, that has been um, derived from crystals of this spike protein. So you see, this is a trimeric protein that interacts with a cellular receptor, which is called ACE2, which is expressed on many different cells in the body. And this part of the virus that binds to the cellular receptor is called the receptor binding domain. And you will have certainly um, heard this acronym 
uh, when listening to the news and um, talking about viral variants um, that have changed their receptor binding domain and may therefore have either increased um, efficiency to infect cells or may perhaps even escape immunity. So the infection process, um, as I mentioned, that occurs through this um, receptor ACE2 on the surface of the epithelial cells, and then the virus is ingested um, into um, the cell through endocytotic processes and starts replication. And this process of infection and then the ensuing immune response actually leads to a sequelae of different aspects like vascular leakage, inflammation, um, and, and a uh, coagulopathy. But I will guide you through these different aspects step by step. But let me start to introduce you to the more general concept of a virus, how it hitchhikes um, um, a cell, and how the immune response is actually designed to defend actually against this. So the virus is um, a, um, a moiety that carries basically two, um, two components. One is genetic information. This can be in the form of RNA or DNA. In the form of SARS-CoV-2, it is actually RNA. And this serves as a template for replication. So it has, uh, it contains the necessary genetic information for the virus to replicate and to generate progeny virus. The second um, component is an, uh, a structural aspect, and that is uh, nucleocapsid and uh, um, surface membranes uh, that you see here. And these are actually meant to um, allow the virus to survive when it is outside of a cell. Um, and it is typically used by viruses to target their cells of, uh, that they would like to uh, replicate in. So viruses that actually then infect cells abuse the um, competence of cells in metabolism and in replication because the virus itself cannot generate energy and it cannot replicate. So it needs the cell uh, to nurture uh, on its metabolic competence and replication machinery to generate progeny virus. And um, this is actually um, an underestimation of what happens if one virus infects a cell. Typically, one infected cell gives rise to several hundreds to thousands of infectious variants um, then upon a full uh, replicative cycle of the virus. And this already tells you that um, few viruses can initiate infection and then can rapidly lead to production of much higher numbers of viruses that need to be rapidly controlled by our, by our immune system in order to avoid the virus to take over. So just a short glimpse into what happens after a virus infects a cell and further um, talks during this lecture series will um, guide you then through the details of this process. But for the purpose also of understanding how the immune system then responds to viral infection, it's important to understand here also the replication cycle. So the virus infects cells through the um, receptor that we discussed, the ACE2. Um, then the viral genome is released and it is actually amplified through cellular um, amplification um, machines. Um, and then actually um, from this proteins are made, viral proteins like the nucleocapsid, the spike, the surface um, um, antigen, um, membrane envelopes and, and others. Um, and these are then built into a part of the cell which is necessary actually to um, uh, generate um, uh, proteins and integrate them into membranes, which is called the endoplasmatic reticulum. And from here, um, viral particles are formed that are then also loaded in a uh, structured process with uh, the uh, nucleocapsid and typically within the nucleocapsid, the uh, viral genome uh, sequences are stored. 
And with this, a new virus is generated. But it means also that during this process, the virus leaves traces in the infected cell that serves then to um, inform the immune system that this virus that has helped the virus to replicate is actually infected. So there are several replication strategies that are used by viruses in general. Um, so one is that these viruses infect cells and replicate, but then actually leave the cell alive. So the viruses don't do harm to the infected cells. In case of SARS-CoV-2, this is not the case because most of the cells that are infected by SARS-CoV-2 after the virus has started replication will actually die. So this creates an inflammatory stimulus, which is then actually helpful for mounting a rapid immune response. A third type of replication um, um, or viral replication strategy is used by hepatitis viruses or by the human immunodeficiency virus, where there's also um, no um, cytopathic effect. So the virus will not kill the cell, but it will establish a persistence form. So typically these viruses establish a long lasting or can establish a long lasting infection. Whereas from SARS-CoV-2, we are not aware that there are chronic infections, but all of these infections typically are sooner or later uh, controlled by the immune response. But as we uh, hear later with different outcomes. So the immune response then is actually tailored to these different replication strategies. Um, and it tries to limit further infection. We will discuss how this is done. Eliminate infected cells. And one important thing is to keep infection local. So prevent dissemination of the virus to other parts of the body. There is a self um, constraint built into the system, um, which we are beginning more and more to understand. That is um, that um, immune responses are shut off in situations when the costs for elimination of the viruses are too high. In other words, if the tissue damage is too strong um, and or organ damage is too strong, then immune responses are typically shut off, um, which then in essence would lead to viral persistence, uh, which is true for many situations here, um, but actually may be a reason why we see deleterious disease causes in SARS-CoV-2 infected. Um, individuals. So let me go now a little bit deeper into how the immune system is actually structured and optimized to provide protection against infection. So the immune system is um, not something which is only found in a certain part of the body, but it is actually distributed throughout the bodies and essential for its proper function are highways. Mm -hmm. These highways for immune cells in the body are the lymphatics. And the lymphatics uh, transport the immune cells rapidly throughout the entire body and help um, the immune cells to actually um, search for potential intruders, such as viruses. So specialized immune cell populations are actually involved in detection of virus, information retrieval, this means taking up information from the virus, either in the form of um, the genetic information or in form of the protein, process this information and present this information to other immune cells. Then there are immune cells that help in organizing immune responses uh, in order to achieve optimal effector functions. And then finally, there are control cells. So these cells that instruct and help recognize um, viruses are typically these um, macrophages and dendritic cells. Uh, the helper cells, the T helper cells are those cells which help in organizing. And the CDA T cells and B cells, um, both of the lymphocyte um, population um, of immune cells, actually are effector cells um, that are there to contain uh, or block viral infection. And finally, we have these regulatory cells and suppressor cells that help control overzealous immunity. So these cells executing effector functions with high precision, the T and the B cells, 
they are generated actually um, from a pool of genes. So they are um, perhaps not even there yet during the time of infection, but they are uh, randomly generated in a process um, that is called homologous recombination and which leads to um, a generation of highly specific uh, lymphocyte populations. Um, and this immune response is then actually imprinted as a memory uh, into the um, immune system of the particular individual as an I have seen you before strategy. So this helps to localize um, virus more quickly and to mount a rapid response to infection. Because the memory cells that are formed here remember, if you like, the virus and then help to the body to defend it, um, to, def um, to mount more quickly defense against the virus. So how does the immune system actually see the virus and uh, can actually um, engage in blocking of infection? So one is by antibodies um, that can be directed against the surface uh, proteins, so the spike antigens, um, and the macrophages that can then take up uh, these viruses and eliminate um, the virus that is ingested. The second phase is uh, when um, the affected T cells recognize um, cells that have uh, helped the virus to replicate because they generate viral antigens and these viral antigens are then degraded into peptides that are presented here on the, um, in the context of MHC class one molecules to CD8 T cells. And this shows uh, the two principles that are used by the immune system to contain infection. One is preventing or reducing infection and the other one is killing of infected cells. So these are the archetypes of the immune response against SARS-CoV-2 infection. So what is so special about SARS-CoV-2? So obviously nobody of us, I believe, um, can read this, which is hello in uh, Chinese, in Cantonese. Um, so obviously the immune um, response has never seen the virus. So it has to translate the information um, and find um, the correct cells that could be used to tackle the virus. Um, so one thing about SARS-CoV-2 is that there was no specific immunity in the human population because SARS-CoV-2 is a zoonosis. So it comes from um, bats um, and has jumped the species barrier um, and has therefore entered a host that has not been in contact with the virus before. Meaning that our immune system is in its true sense naive with respect to the um, encounter of this virus. Nevertheless, as I mentioned to you before, there's an enormous diversity um, that can be generated in terms of specific uh, receptors recognizing and translating um, this message into the right terms that can be understood by the, um, and ca that can be seen by the immune response and then be used for mounting an immune response. Yet, this takes time. That is something which may be a problem um, during SARS-CoV-2 infection because we need to contain uh, the viral infection quickly. There's also some cross-reactivity um, between um, uh, SARS-CoV-2 and other coronaviruses at the level of immune cells. So some immune cells that have encountered other coronaviruses that are typically common cold viruses um, can cross-react with SARS-CoV-2. The relevance of this is still under investigation, but it will be interesting to see whether this actually provides protection or it's just an, an incident that has been observed. So the immune response is structured, as you see here, into um, this innate immune response where uh, the virus is actually uh, taken up by um, highly specialized information retrieving and information processing cells, the dendritic cells, then there's induction of adaptive immunity with the different um, 
components that we already discussed. And then we have generation of um, B cell responses um, where antibodies against specific against SARS-CoV-2 are being produced and where um, 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 cytotoxic um, CD8 T cells are generated that can kill. And finally, we have the generation of these memory, um, immune memory that I mentioned. So the relevant targets of the immune response against SARS-CoV-2 are, on the one side, these surface antigens, because they are most easily accessible to the antibodies, but also others like nuclear capsid antigen and surface antigens, if T cells recognize um, virus infected cells, which will then lead to the killing of these cells. So the two aspects of preventing infection through antibodies that um, impair the binding of the uh, receptor binding domain of the spike antigen of the virus with the receptor. And these are then called neutralizing antibodies because they prevent interaction of the virus with the cellular receptor or killing of the infected cells. So this allows us or to use um, this knowledge to monitor um, the SARS-CoV-2 specific immunity uh, in people um, um, who have seen the virus. So we can use, we can monitor um, the presence of antibodies and we can monitor over the presence of T cells. And this gives you a short um, glimpse on the research that has been done here at the Klinikum Rechts der ISA where we studied a cohort of 4,500 healthcare workers uh, during the early days of the um, um, pandemic in March and April of 2020, and followed them then throughout the entire year and observed that there is a continuous um, drop of the levels of the SARS-CoV-2 specific antibodies. So what you see here is there's a continuous drop and many of the um, people who had initially after the infection um, had mounted a strong antibody response have um, much lower antibody titers now or have even lost their antibodies. So when we now look also at neutralizing antibodies that are measured um, by a so-called IC50 assay, uh, so a neutralizing um, test assay, where 50% of the infectivity um, is then counted at uh, what dilution of the virus that is depicted here, you see that there is a continuous loss of um, the neutralizing of the title of the neutralizing um, 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 neutralizing antibody titers at the same time as a loss of the antibodies. So meaning that over time after the infection, there's a rapid disappearance of uh, antibodies that could protect us from infection. Nevertheless, when we look at the lymphocytes in the blood of these individuals who contained infection, we find that there is um, high numbers of the SARS-CoV-2 specific cells that express cytokines and are therefore can be considered effector cells. So the lessons from studying these dynamics of SARS-CoV-2 specific immunity after infection told us that there is a rapid waning of these virus-specific antibodies. Um, but as a good um, news, we have found that many of these people still have B cells that are uh, producers of these antibodies, but have stopped um, being a rich source for these antibodies. So, um, giving rise to the assumption that probably upon re-encounter with the virus, these cells would quickly mount antibody responses again. And um, there is also in the T cell compartment, a substantial number of SARS-CoV-2 specific T cells that can be detected up to nine months after infection. So we see that there is uh, a long lasting protection, which is good news, um, but we will study in further um, and further trials, whether this may need a helping hand from vaccination. And you will hear more um, of this during the other talks in this lecture series. Um, 
So there are still a couple of things which are unclear. So um, I mentioned that there is the SARS-CoV-2 specific immunity, uh, which contributes to the control of viral infection. And we know this because individuals that recovered from infection are rarely reinfected. So it, uh, this already tells us that it's um, possible by um, immu having immunity to the virus to um, um, be infected a second time. And also the first results from the um, vaccination trials showed us that there is a very good protection um, if you were infected, uh, if you were vaccinated with mRNA uh, based vaccines, giving a um, protection efficiency of around 95%. However, there is no consensus yet what the correlate of immune protection is. So if you measure, if you have to measure antibody responses or do we have to measure T cell responses, we don't know yet. Uh, we also don't know how long this duration, um, how long the duration of this immune protection is. Um, only time will tell in careful studies. Um, and we also don't know uh, whether the rapid control of SARS-CoV-2 uh, by the immune response is actually favorable, uh, the most favorable aspect, or whether other aspects of um, immunity to the virus is important in order to prevent us from developing disease. So everything I told you about so far is about the first days of SARS-CoV-2 infection, which in this sketch here um, that uh, comes from the uh, review in the New England Journal of Medicine uh, late in 2020, um, it all relates to this early phase of infection, which is termed here the incubation period. Um, so this first phase is actually where most of the viral control uh, of our replication um, and the effect of the immune system about uh, on keeping infection local and containment of virus is actually being achieved. And then there comes a second phase of the disease, uh, which is our, uh, now called COVID-19. And this is the phase where really the symptoms and disease occurs. And this transition from infection to disease is the, one of the most interesting parts of the research uh, in SARS-CoV-2 and COVID-19. Um, so in this phase, we have development of disease. We have uh, different organ systems um, that uh, can suffer damage. We observe an increased incidence of thromboembolic events. And really, this uh, disease is not restricted to the lung anymore, but it's a multi-system disease. And looking more closely, many of these features um, of um, illnesses are then not directly related to viral replication anymore, as you see here, but is more now related to inflammation. Inflammation that is driven actually by the immune response. Um, and therefore, um, while in the initial phase, it's uh, beneficial to control viral replication, also through the help of antiviral therapy or antibody therapy, these later stages of disease profit much uh, more likely from anti-inflammatory therapy, such as um, provision of corticosteroids. So what happens during the second phase, which um, seems to be related to inflammation and overshooting immunity? And one of the key aspects is, is the development of widespread damage in the vasculature. You see here an electron micrograph of a normal endothelial cells in lungs so this would be the alveolar space that is surrounded here by this uh, capillary network where gas exchange occurs. And you see here that under these circumstances, you see that these microvessels are severely damaged. And that correlates with the um, uh, severe respiratory dysfunction that is observed in these patients, where sometimes also mechanical ventilation is not enough and we have to go into ECMO therapy where uh, artificial oxygenation of the blood has to take place. But very likely, this is mainly mediated by an overshooting immune response. And this spread from the infection of the lung to uh, a disseminated uh, effect of overshooting immunity um, is an effect that is mediated on endothelial cells as well as on thrombocytes, leads to damage to endothelial cells, uh, thrombocyte activation, 
and a number of um, uh, secondary avalanche-like effects that lead then to um, a vasculitis syndrome, thromboembolic invention, slut formation, um, and um, requires often then intervention to remove thrombotic material or stenting. So, but all of this is triggered by um, processes where um, activation of the immune response um, is widespread uh, and immune factors like um, autoantibodies, um, cytokines, chemokines, complement activation, uh, all act on platelets to induce a hypercoagulable state leading to thrombus formation. And this is very likely then leading to um, uh, thromboembolic disease processes that is often observed um, in COVID-19 patients and leading then to this rapid deterioration of organ function, um, often also observed on the intensive care units. So the immunopathology behind this uh, is still very incompletely understood. But um, it is believed that there um, is a process which is in broad terms called cytokine storm, where a um, broad and completely overshooting um, immune response leads to a complete deterioration of many aspects. This is um, a systemic activation of immune cells, a loss of immune cells that circulate uh, within the blood, which probably goes hand in hand with accumulation in tissues, but this is very difficult to test. We see the collateral immune-mediated damage in tissues such as endothelial damage. Um, and we know uh, also now that um, this damage is not only short-lasting, but may actually lead also to organ dysfunction over protected time periods after the infection has been cleared. So meaning that also people who have not suffered from severe COVID-19 disease may have long lasting organ um, damage, such as lung damage, which we now also observe, observe more often in patients uh, who recover from SARS-CoV-2 infection, sometimes without um, 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 large number of symptoms or disease processes, but they are restricted in the lung function um, after their recovery. So, um, I introduced you to the concept that there is this um, good phase of immunity of our immune system responding to SARS-CoV-2. It protects us um, from um, infection and from development of COVID-19. Um, also the vaccination uh, protects us from COVID-19 and it does so by keeping the infection local, by acting early and probably by preventing the transition from um, the infection by rapid control of the virus uh, and not let it, let it go to, uh, to go on to disease. Yet the trigger points um, that act exactly at this transition from the infection to the disease are still unclear. So the effectors that we can measure um, and which we will use hopefully in the future to provide um, more definitive information um, on a protective status uh, are relevant to prevent and contain infection. And we discussed that these are antibodies and specific uh, T cells. However, all of this immune monitoring currently is not uh, sufficient to uh, give us answers with the um, high certainty about these immune correlates of infection. So for the future, there will be no immune passport that we can issue um, to give you a certainty um, that you will be safe. And also we don't know about the length of protection. So the way our immune system copes with SARS-CoV-2 is really a double-edged sword. There are good things, uh, which is the rapid control of infection, the um, prevention of viral spread and rapid elimination of infected cells and keeping infection local. Um, and as a result of all of this built up of a memory against SARS-CoV-2. The bad things are that if things go wrong, um, then the immune response is also responsible for overshooting uh, responses, um, inducing cytokine storm, 
inducing damage to endothelial cells and causing thromboembolic invalves and organ failure. And most of the uh, sequelae that we see uh, long-term are really related to this overshooting immune response. So the open issues uh, for um, future research will be uh, how long the immune protection um, lasts and can we make this even more durable or do we have to vaccinate once a year? Um, we need to understand the basis for keeping infection local and why actually, um, um, infection goes on to systemic disease. So these trigger points of systemic immune activation are of utmost importance um, and um, research is going on quickly and hopefully within the next um, couple of months or um, years we will know more about this because what we really want to do is if also you uh, are aware late that you're infected, uh, we want to develop methods to prevent and contain this overshooting immune activation. So this brings me to an end. I hope that you enjoyed the lecture and that you are now better informed about the um, dual role of the immune response in during SARS-CoV-2 infection and COVID-19. Many thanks for your attention. And I give back to Marion Kiesle. Ja, lieber Percy Knolle, vielen Dank für deinen tollen und äh, wirklich sehr guten und verständlichen Vortrag. Ähm, ich habe jetzt keine Fragen bekommen aus der Zuhörerschaft, aber ich hätte natürlich eine Frage an dich. Äh, als Frau, als Frauenärztin äh, stellt man ja fest, es gibt viele Unterschiede zwischen Mann und Frau, die ja auch gut sind. Äh, und man hört ja, dass Frauen mit dieser Infektion besser umgehen können als Männer, also häufiger einen weniger schweren Verlauf dieser Erkrankung erleiden müssen. Woran liegt es? Liegt es an dem Immunsystem oder was sind da deine Theorien oder die Theorien äh, der Wissenschaft dazu? Also die, ähm, die, du sprichst ja den Unterschied zwischen Mann und Frau an. Hier werden wir jetzt nicht... Bisher gibt es nichts, sagen wir mal so, was uns direkt sagen würde ähm, oder eine Erklärung dafür geben könnte, warum es da unterschiedliche Krankheitsverläufe gibt. Was allerdings bekannt ist, dass Frauen und Männer unterschiedlich stark auf Infektionen reagieren und insbesondere die Menge an freigesetzten Interferon, also Typ 1 Interferon, die typischerweise bei Virusinfektionen sehr schnell vom Immunsystem gemacht werden, um andere Zellen zu informieren, dass eine Infektion dort ist und eine schnelle Abwehrreaktion zu machen dass die Dynamik dieser Freisetzung von Interferonen bei Mann und Frau unterschiedlich sind. Und das hat man sowohl im Tiermodell als auch bei Menschen beobachtet. Also deswegen glaube ich, sind das sehr gute Evidenzen. Was man auch herausgefunden hat, ist, dass die Art und Weise, wie Interferon und in welcher Menge Interferon gebildet wird, nach SARS-CoV-2 auch einen Ausschlag darüber gibt, wie nachher die Schwere der Infektion ist beziehungsweise die Schwere der Erkrankung. Also könnte es sehr wohl sein, dass die unterschiedliche Art der Antwort in Bezug auf die Interferonproduktion dazu beitragen kann, dass wir unterschiedliche Verläufe äh, bei Männern und bei Frauen sehen. Ähm, die ganzen anderen Aspekte, die wir jetzt aber heute besprochen haben, ob das jetzt die Antikörper, die B-Zellen oder die T-Zellen sind, die sind nach wie vor intakt. Das ist unabhängig davon, was für ein Geschlecht ähm, die entsprechende Person hat. Aber trotzdem, die Produktion von verschiedenen Mediatoren in diesem System scheint offenbar da geschlechtsspezifisch reguliert zu sein. Und ich könnte mir sehr gut vorstellen, dass das einer der Gründe ist, warum wir hier unterschiedliche Verläufe auch beobachten. Mhm. Gut, vielen Dank. Wir machen die Erfahrung auch bei den Frühgeborenen. Also die männlichen Frühgeborenen mit Infektionen haben schlechtere Karten als die weiblichen Frühgeborenen. Also so ganz, sogar ganz früh im Leben scheint es auch eine Rolle zu spielen. Und wahrscheinlich liegt es ja daran, dass die Frau eben zwei X-Chromosomen hat und dort eben ja. sehr viele dieser Gene liegen, die für Immunantworten ähm, äh, verantwortlich sind. Gut, also nochmal ganz herzlichen Dank dir, lieber Percy Knolle, für diesen tollen Vortrag. Ihnen, euch zu Hause fürs Zuhören. Und ich hoffe, ihr seid bei, am nächsten Mittwoch wieder dabei, 18.15 Uhr. Ich verspreche, dass die Technik besser funktionieren wird. Und wir hören einen sehr interessanten Vortrag von 
Frau Professor Ulrike Protzer, sie ist ja unsere Virologin hier an der Technischen Universität und im Klinikum Rechts der ISA, Ihnen vielleicht schon bekannt durch Funk und Fernsehen, wo sie ja sehr oft aufgetreten ist und uns sehr viel erklärt hat schon über das Virus und auch die Bayerische Staatsregierung dazu berät. Sie wird berichten, wie, dieser, wie es zu der Entdeckung dieses Virus gekommen ist und was es mit der Impfung auf sich hat. Herzlichen Dank fürs Zuhören. Wie gesagt, der Vortrag wird aufgezeichnet und Sie können ihn auch später noch gerne einmal anhören oder überhaupt anhören. Vielen Dank.